I'm Madeline James and welcome to the first part of the new I guess series of my world building guide where we're going to be looking at culture, civilization, societies, that sort of thing. So essentially we are going to be uh, populating our earth-like fantasy world with actual people. And for this process I am going to be assuming that you've already gone through the like physical global world building guide process and that you already have most of those maps and we're going to be basically building off of those for a lot of these steps. So let's start looking at this. Alright, so I have a slightly different uh, setup this time because I keep hurting my back. I don't know what's going on, but so I'm kind of slightly weird setup. I apologize if it's weird. But I have my presentation set up. I have my little tablet precariously balanced here so that I can read it. Um, so I'm going to just start going through this. And just so you know, at the beginning of this, I didn't have a lot of good graphics to use. So I just put some cool early civilization map graphics. So those are just something for you to look at. <laughs> um, but so there are many approaches to creating cultures and societies, and in many cases, uh, a storyteller can just build what they need around their story. When I try and do that, I find myself very reliant on real world cultures and societies. And while that is a perfectly great approach, it doesn't allow me to create the kind of unique cultures that I really want to the way I want to. Uh, so just like my main world building guide series, we are going to go far deeper than probably necessary, but I believe the results will be worth it. Alright, so the approach and process that I will be leading you through will be a bit unconventional unconventional for a cultural civilization world building guide. There are no checklists or worksheets or anything like that here, uh, and there will be a lot of decisions that you will have to make as the world builder going through this process. It's going to be a lot less completely prescriptive, right? So we will be world building off of our global maps, mainly climate, biome, and elevation, uh, with the idea that human nature is strongly linked to the physical environment those civilizations developed in. After all, one's environment provides a lot of challenges that humanity has to overcome to succeed. And my hope is to present you with the inherent advantages, disadvantages, and obstacles to different environments, as well as some of the ways civilizations can adapt to be able to conquer them or not. And the first part of this guide will be focusing on creating a global boundary map for isolating cultural and civilization clusters. And this is an important step to make sure we consider cultural and technological exchange and the impacts of having a sizable network versus developing in isolation. So disclaimer, and this same disclaimer is gonna apply to this entire series, but for our purposes, we are not trying to explain the nature and cultures of real peoples or delve into the true complexity of those topics. Our aim is to fill our worlds with fictional cultures and societies that are deeply rooted in their physical world and feel real. We want to look at the trends, patterns, and simplifications of real-world historical civilizations and challenges that people faced to consider the ways they overcame them and other ways that a fictional people could do so as well. If you are an anthropologist, you will probably find this system overly simple and perhaps a bit reaching, but it is certainly not meant to, an ex to be an explanation for the development of real world cultures. And also remember that in real life, as in this guide, every rule and every pattern can be broken and probably already has been. So before we dive into this too much, and I'll have uh, chapters so you can skip this if you really feel it's unnecessary, but I wanna give a brief warning on pre-modern geographic determinism theories. <laughs> Before we get too far into it, we, are, we won't be talking about this too, too much yet for a couple of parts, but I think it's just a good high-level disclaimer before we go any further. But the main school of thought concerning the causal relationship between the physical land and the people that live there, geographic determinism, has a long and difficult history. Before modern times, it was problematic to say the least, and I don't believe we can proceed without touching on it, but the nature of people is a softer science than the physical nature of the world around us, much more open to interpretation and our own biases. All the way back to the Greeks and Romans, at least, philosophers came to the idea that the nature of people was determined by the physical world they live in. Geographic determinism, we'll get to it more later. But philosophers from both Rome and Greece attributed their physical environment with their success and superiority. In Aristotle's philosophical work, Politics, he presented the argument that people from colder climates were 
quote, full of spirit but wanting in intelligence and skill, end quote, but that those in warmer climates were, quote, wanting in spirit and therefore they are always in a state of subjugation and slavery, end quote. And I have that linked below where you can read more about that um, example. But these ideas of geographic and climatic determinism were commonly used as a way to other those from different places and mark them as lesser, especially by those in power. Many believe that warmer climates led to laziness, thus explaining the apparent lack of advanced civilizations that they saw in the tropics. They were clearly not hardworking enough to succeed. Please note that was dripping with sarcasm. Uh, even Adolf Hitler used geographic determinism as one of his many claims for the supremacy of the Nordic race. Beliefs in geographic determinism were also largely used to justify colonial and imperial mindsets, and these nations pretended science backed their racism, legitimizing slavery and colonization. I would like it to be extremely clear that I find these arguments abhorrent and wish to avoid perpetrating any of the extremely harmful sides of this school of thought. I considered not touching on any of this history, but as I expect, the only people taking the time to go through this are as inquisitive and nerdy as I am and likely to do further research, so I feel morally obligated to provide such a warning and also give everyone the impetus to really think critically about things they've learned already about this, things that they might assume, things that they read out and about, and all of that. So on that end, we have to be diligent and careful in our reading of any texts and ideas on geographic determinism, particularly those before like the 1900s. If you plan to do additional research on your own, I highly recommend first starting with some sources that delve into the misleading, incorrect, and harmful sides in this area, such as Determinism and Possibilism, a critical epistemological analysis by Jose Alexandre de Quadros which is very good, by the way. And also beware forum posts and generalizations on world building culture from geography thrown around carelessly on the internet as well. It is easy to run into gross simplifications that likely unintentionally pull from some of the more harmful and misleading theories. The current school of thought uh, for environmental or geographic determinism, which is, it has so many names, you can also call it climatic determinism, social Darwinism, etc. Um, is a school of thought based on the idea that the physical environment shapes human nature and the fate of societies. In the early 20th century, there was a change in the views on environmental determinism as people were beginning to understand the racist and imperialistic issues plaguing the topic. And this led to a revival of the idea, sometimes generally called neo-environmental determinism. Uh, Paul Vidal de Leblanc, a French geographer, established his own school called Geographic Possibilism, which only claimed geography applied limits to culture but did not define it entirely. Modern thoughts tend to reject the imperialistic and racist ideas that were presented before the 20th century, and the more modern geographic determinism schools that have also branched off tend to be a lot less um, problematic, right? So referencing geographic determinism, environmental determinism, etc., etc., can still be a pretty touchy subject for modern geographers and historians due to the historical implications of this school of thought and the tendency to oversimplify. Most people in this day and age that write research debate on topics of geographic determinism do not believe in complete de determinism to the extent that some used to. And one of the most popular books that recently caused a resurgence of the school of thought is Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. He actually posted a rant about using geographic determinism to describe his book on his website, which I will link below, and it is a fun read. But one of the biggest uh, criticisms of this book in general is that it doesn't take into account the choices of people very much. And so while this may, you know, you could argue that maybe this isn't the best complete explanation of how human civilization developed or that it's an oversimplification. This is the type of thing that is very useful for our purposes where we need to oversimplify, we need to generalize, and we need to take these basic raw patterns and then not follow them exactly, right? So the later parts of this guide will be pulling from a decent bit of books and research that could be classified as modern geographic determinism. Uh, but we are going to be very careful about it. So, with all that said, 
let's start talking about culture and civilization barriers. So within certain geographic areas, civilizations will interact with each other. Perhaps this is due to trade, making alliances, going to war, or any number of other reasons, but regardless, what we will see within these areas are civilizations that are learning from each other and dealing with similar problems. Through the many cycles of expansion and conquest, civilizations also tend to stay within these areas for a good portion of history. Civilizations that have spent thousands of years learning to farm in one environment, for example, are unlikely to decide to pack it up and start from scratch somewhere entirely unlike the land they know. So these barriers are mainly geographic. It's harder to trade, migrate, or expand across, say, a desert, mountain, or ocean, especially with earlier civilizations. Traveling across the desert requires intimate knowledge of where water sources are, Going quickly or bringing much along requires domesticated beasts of burden that are evolved to handle the extreme heat and lack of water. In addition, any climate or biome that cannot easily support large stationary civilizations will be a barrier to the spread of civilizations and cultural exchange. This is namely deserts, but can also be places like rainforests. Crossing mountains poses a similar problem. It can be very dangerous without knowing the safest passes and places to seek shelter. The further up you go, the colder it gets, colder than someone from a warmer climate would likely be prepared for. Crossing the open ocean requires a civilization to develop sufficient navigational and shipmaking technology, and still comes with inherent risk of being capsized by storms, malnutrition causing illnesses like scurvy, injuries, losing the wind and becoming stranded, etc. While navigable rivers and bays or seas are pretty helpful for the spread of civilizations and culture, less navigable rivers will be a hindrance. This includes rivers that are very dangerous to cross or traverse, and as we covered in our rivers world building part, the steeper the land uh, a river is traveling across, the faster the flow will be. Less advanced civilizations may find most rivers or bodies of water to be enough of a boundary to limit crossing them. While certainly not impassable, the geographic barriers that we will be mapping pose enough of a problem to prevent significant cultural exchange and civilization expansion. And also to note, we will get into this more later, but you will have civilizations in these areas. But that's, that's a given right now, right? So the other barrier we will be mapping is climatic. In our history, agricultural technology tends to spread easily east to west as you're mo more likely to have more compatibility in this direction. Many civilizations and empires also tend to spread laterally due to the ease of sharing ideas and innovations. The clothing, homes, crops, and animals that were developed for the warm Mediterranean aren't going to help much in a subpolar forest, but in another warm Mediterranean climate, they'll do great. You may have additional types of barriers depending on the magic in your world. The Unsea or the Shadow Fold in Lee Bardugo's Grishaverse is a great example of this. You may also have magical or other reasons for ignoring some of the barriers we are considering. And if you have anything like this, take the time to determine what those barriers will be for your world and what their extent will be. The climatic barriers are going to be more of initial, um, what are they called, like physiographic regions uh, and will sort of be initial civilization barriers or clusters and the geographic ones are going to create more large scale cultural clusters. So where you have a climatic barrier with no geographic one, there will still be plenty of trading, diplomacy, and exchange, though it will be less likely for a civilization to spread across that barrier to a dissimilar climate. Geographic barriers would prevent both of those things. The areas within each of these boundaries will not necessarily represent a single society and culture, but a cultural cluster. A cultural cluster is a group of societies or nations that share enough cultural features so as to be distinctly similar when compared to other clusters. These societies may commonly share a religion, history, geographic proximity, level of economic development, etc. And within these cultures you would expect large amounts of cultural and technological exchange, closer relations, whether that be positive or negative, and a degree of diplomatic similarity. So let's talk about technological ages real quick. And I have a list up here of just some of the common ones that I pulled from a lesson on the technological history timeline on study.com, which I will link below. But it is important to note that the degree of these boundaries is going to be different depending on what equivalent age your world is in, 
And also note that across your world, different places are not going to be necessarily in the same technological age, so keep that in mind. But a Neolithic world where you have more granular boundaries, like small rivers, versus a more modern world of empires and global expansion, civilizations in exchange are going to be restricted by fewer boundaries. So this is not to say that you can't choose any technological era for a fantasy, but there are definitely some trends. There are very few fantasy stories I'm aware of that are pre-Iron Age, and stories more technologically advanced than the Renaissance tend to be specific subgenres, subgenres like urban fantasy, steampunk fantasy, etc. So the Greenbone Saga by Fonda Lee is probably early information age. They have guns, cars, typewriters, and I would put Lord of the Rings somewhere late Middle Ages to Renaissance. And a lot of the Dungeons and Dragons settings, like the Forgotten Realms, are probably about 16th century in a Renaissance-like age. Game of Thrones is late medieval. And I would say the Middle Ages and Renaissance are probably the most common. It is a good idea to have an idea of what technological age or max technological age or ages uh, you're going to be focusing on for creating your societies. And we will account for there being a difference in like economic development and technological development and ages within different clusters and areas later, but we are going to be creating divides that should sufficiently work for a world technologically in its Iron Age to late Middle Ages, think the equivalent of 700 BCE to 1400 CE. And if you are working with a world before or earlier in this time, just be a lot more generous in placing your divides and dividing up your societies. And if you're working with the world after this time, I would still recommend using this process and then taking the time to determine how your civilizations will expand across barriers afterwards. We will do a little bit of this as well regardless, just to place some like larger empires and look at some of the likely conflict that you would be seeing. But these clusters that we're going to be creating here will still be highly impactful in your world. So mapping culture and civilization boundaries, and these are essentially our physiographic regions. We've already discussed the geographic and climatic boundaries that isolate populations and restrict diffusion. So let's start a new, a new map. You can title this clusters or physiographic regions, um, and you'll probably need to make a few iterations of this map, but you'll want to draw berries along each of the following. First being oceans, open oceans. And you don't really need to draw all these. It depends on how close your um, land masses are. As you can see here with mine, they're all very far apart, so the ocean boundaries look really dumb. Um, but this can also be dangerous fast-moving rivers if you think it fits. I didn't include any of these in mind because the boundaries sort of all lined up for me sort of in areas that I kind of thought would be kind of restricted anyway, so I didn't include these, but you feel free to do that. The next one is surrounding mountainous areas. And don't just trace the ridgeline. Mark around where it switches from like hills to actual mountains, aka where you start to see steep elevation change. The land inside these mountainous regions can be cultural clusters of their own, and in some areas you will see perhaps nomadic groups or fully developed civilizations inside of them. And then the last one is deserts and non-plain steppes. And this is kind of going to be up to your discretion a little bit looking at your maps, but circle your deserts and then you can include any of your steppe regions that are going to be harder to traverse, particularly if it's a more like mountainous steppe. So I sort of went through and did this here on my map and you can see my eastern continent is kind of has a lot of barriers that are going to be very difficult to traverse. So then here's my map with all of my geographic divides on it and you can see this is very messy looking uh, but don't worry about that yet. Uh, for the next part you will definitely need to use a bit of discretion based off your specific map and perhaps even what technological age you're working with and just the general story you want to tell but we don't want to cut off any tiny chunks of land, um, try to worry about larger divides, and I tend to make the climatic boundaries on a separate map and then combine them with, with these geographic ones at the end. So first we're going to look at transitions between different climates. You can look at your biomes map, which I have here sort of like, um, like sort of faded out a little bit so you can sort of see the lines, but there can be natural barriers between the following biome types desert slash steppe biomes, which support a very low density of people. You'll typically see nomads here, uh, large scrublands, grassland biomes that sometimes won't support large civilizations just to the fire risk, um, or maybe great for herding cultures, 
uh, deciduous woodlands with fertile soil for agriculture, evergreen woodlands without fertile soil for agriculture. That includes rainforests and more like conifer forests and the taiga and stuff like that. And then if you want to look at more options for natural barriers, you can also look at the specific climate regions instead of the biomes. And there can be natural barriers between your arid or B starting regions, your tropical A starting regions, your temperate-ish, which is going to be your C and your D, A, D, B regions, subarctic, which is going to be D uh, ending in C or D regions, and your arctic polar E regions. Um, I typically though will look at biomes and then I will separate my temperate and subarctic forest using the climate map after using the general biome divides because I find that's a little bit simpler and I think it makes a little bit more sense. And then lastly, if there are any desert or steppe regions, you can circle what would be the floodplains around any major rivers. Uh, these are possible agricultural centers in a region that otherwise wouldn't support as much agriculture. So you'll see a distinct divide here between the civilizations that could live in these uh, floodplains or river valleys versus elsewhere in these regions. Um, and I don't always end up with all of these being their own distinct regions later on. Sometimes they kind of just extend out other ones depending on what the adjacent biomes are and sometimes it becomes a whole separate region of their own. But you can see I sort of went through and circled all the ones that I think are particularly notable here. So if you look at Earth's coping climate map here, which is on the bottom, compared to the map of Earth civilizations in or around 500 BCE, which is the top map here, and nope, these aren't individual civilizations, these are like groups of similar civilizations, right? Like uh, you have the West African cereal farmers and Saharan pastoral nomads. It's very small font, it's hard to read, but like those kind of similar groups. Um, you can see a lot of distinct similarities in the boundaries here, right? And I think it is worth looking up a map of empires and civilizations in the area you are, in the era you are roughly basing your technological level on and comparing them with climate and biome maps. I had trouble finding ones that were open source, but there are plenty out there, so I would just take a little bit of time to look into those if you think you need a bit more, you know, to go on. Um, so then, final divides. Now you want to go through and clean everything up. None of your areas should be too big, and if there are two different divides near each other, say a biome versus elevation divide, you can go ahead and just put one divide in between these so you don't have tiny slivers of the transitions between those. And this will probably take a bit of playing around with to get it to look the way you want. This map will essentially be for um, physiographic regions or small scale clusters of civilizations and culture. And remember, this is not a hard guideline. This is a starting point for you to consider an easy default, if you will, where you can come up with the intentional deviations and the reasoning behind them. And this reasoning a lot of times is where you get the cool stuff from anyway. So this is what my sort of final divides look like, and also remember that with this sort of a projection that I use for my map, um, at your poles these divides should be a little bit bigger because it's that land is not actually as big as it looks like it is, right? So then, labels. I also have a separate layer where I put little labels to help me remember why an area is separate. Because these are essentially physiographic regions, this might be the biome combined with the geography. For example, a mountainous steppe or a hilly forest. Whatever I think will help me distinguish it later, that's what I throw on here, just so I, so I have a quick and easy reference. Alright, so next we're going to start mapping our larger scale actual cultural clusters. And I lightly gray out the areas that represent geographic barriers or, as I think makes the most sense, regions that are difficult to traverse. You will probably have people living in these areas and trading across these barriers, especially in more recent times. But for most of history, there would have these would have prevented much cultural exchange. These areas are deserts, mountains and plateaus, rainforests, tundra and ice sheets. Now there will still be civilizations within these areas, advanced ones even, but the important thing for now is that while civilizations on one side of these grayed out areas will interact with those in the adjacent grayed out areas, they will probably have little direct in interactions with those on the opposite side, right? So what you will be left with are little clusters of area where 
there would have been a decent bit of trade and cultural exchange. You might expect more shared technology, trading, shared history, religions, and general cultural exchange in these areas. And we've considered our technological age and started our cultural clusters map by marking in the barriers to civilization and cultural exchange. And in the next few parts, we will map out human migration paths and extinction events. And I included some references and links in the blog post, which will be linked below. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and comment if you have any thoughts. Um, and if you have any questions, found any problems, have a request for something to include, please let me know. But otherwise, I will see you in the next one.